Up in the rafters, hello. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you. It's really a privilege to speak to you again one last time. Then we entered into the full week with Dan Davis in the mornings, and that'll be grand, I'm sure. I look forward to that. Um, it's been a real joy to be at Chamberfest and uh, engage in our chapel times and then through the days with uh, different students chatting away and counselors and some of the faculty, and I just counted a real privilege. I think uh, many of you know, maybe some of you don't, that I had the great privilege of growing up as a missionary child. I became kind of a rebellious child, but nonetheless a good beginning, and then turned around when I really met Jesus. But as a missionary child in what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo, when I was there, it was the Belgian Congo and then became Zaire, and then went through lots of turmoil and is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. My parents were medical missionaries, and we lived in the DRC Congo for quite a number of years. And so, of course, I have many memories uh, from that time. But one in particular involves a bigger than life African man whose name was Bishop John Wesley Shungu. I'm proud to share a bit of a name with him. He was a larger than life guy. He was the district bishop for the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And he was a large man and he rode a large motorcycle all over his 300 mile district with a very large high caliber rifle slung across his back to protect him from wild animals and from even the roving bandits that were not infrequent at, in Congo at that time. Bishop John Wesley Shungo was infamous because he had gained the trust of the Belgian Catholic clergy who were scattered all over Congo. And they had built European-style cathedrals. Not the best missionary approach, but that's what they did. They had built European-style cathedrals in all the major cities and in all the larger villages, not only in Congo, but also in neighboring Angola. And Bishop John Wesley Shungu preached in all these cathedrals many, many times through the year. What I remember most was his very large, infectious smile and a trademark twinkle that would come to his eye as he happily challenged African Christians with what it meant for them to follow Christ. The occasion that I most vividly remember was when I was 14 years old, when I stood with my father and listened in on a very, very important conversation. The various warring factions in Congo had so depleted the country's entire economy that there was literally, literally no currency available. And the local villagers were on the brink of famine simply because they could not buy the seed so as to grow their simple crops and to feed their small numbers of cattle. So the churches, Protestant and Catholic alike, banded together to scour the countryside and all of the cities and villages to see if any supply of gold or silver could be found and turned into simple currency. Paper money was totally useless, untrusted in Congo at that time. And Bishop John Wesley Shungu was given charge over all this task. But to no avail, there was absolutely no silver or gold anywhere at all. An emergency meeting was called in the conference rooms of the hospital that my father directed in Kimpesi in order to hear reports of all this. And the entire tone of that meeting was quite hopeless and despairing until one rather impious 
young Catholic priest spoke up loudly as my father and I listened in. And he said, there is only one place, Bishop, Bishop Shungu, where silver and gold are to be had in all the country and in Angola as well, in the cathedrals, within the holy confines of the church. There, Bishop Shungu, there is silver and gold in abundance, all contained in the holy statues of the saints of bygone days in the statuary of our holy church. But surely, Bishop, as you well know, we dare not intrude into the church. We cannot touch the holy saints. And with that, there came that well-known mischievous twinkle into John Wesley Shungu's eye, and a huge smile burst across his face, and that is, this is what he said. Well then, let's melt down the saints and put them into circulation. Time to melt down the saints and get them into circulation. That stuck with me as a 14-year-old boy standing with my father listening into all this. These saints need to be melted down, get out into circulation. Any saints here today that we could possibly melt down and get out into the world? Some of you will know that the Bible refers to all sincere followers of Jesus as saints the holy ones, the set-apart ones. Any saints here today, young musical saints who perhaps need to be broken, melted, and put into circulation in the world? Psalm 67 I'll ask you to have that open before you. Psalm 67 was written because Israel, the representative people of God, needed to be melted down. All along in raising her up, God had intended that Israel would be a model to the ongoing, onlooking nations such a model that others would be drawn to faith in the living God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. A model that would continually look outward, reaching out to people of every race and culture and religious tradition with God's offer of a renewed relationship with him based on faith. She was to be a priest leading all the people of the world to the one true living God. But Israel had become ingrown. She had become solipsistic, which is to say, overly self-absorbed. She had grown proud of her status with God, separatistic toward the nations around her. She had become callous and stubborn and cold-hearted about those separated from the living God. And she needed to be heartbroken again, melted in spirit with the plight of the world disconnected from its creator. And so Psalm 67 was penned to remind Israel of God's vision that went way beyond them and entailed the whole wide world. God will bless us, says this psalm, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. 
So I'd like us to read this tremendous psalm, one of only a few you'll maybe know, with an unnamed author. So it sticks out to us because it's not by David that we know or uh, the sons of Asaph or other writers of the Psalms. It's unnamed, and so it's all the more uh, gripping to us. Who wrote this? Psalm 67. I'd like us to read it together. It's on the screen there. If you can see the bottom verse, can you see it? Turn around or follow along in your book. But I'd like us to read it together aloud. Something about reading in this way kind of gets it into our spirit. So join me as we read it together. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. Then the land will yield its harvest, and God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. Psalm 67 is meant to break down our cold indifference and melt us and get us into the world again. And it does this first by reminding us of God's reason for blessing us. Read it with me once again in verse 1. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. And then later in verses 6 and 7, it is stated again, but this time as an expectation to come. You don't have to read aloud, just listen. God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us and all the ends of the earth will fear him. The Hebrew original of this word blessing, barach, undoubtedly has aspects that suggest material well-being. God blesses us by making provision for us. As verse 6 suggests, and we can hardly escape it, the land will yield its harvest. But the Bible more broadly actually urges us to question what level constitutes material well-being. At what level do you need to be to say, well, now I am materially blessed? And all through the Bible, we're asked to question that. Did you know that a 2015 United Nations subcommittee report concluded that if you have more than one meal a day and you have a dwelling that keeps the climate, the weather out, and you have some sort of reliable transport, for most of the world that's a simple bicycle, then you are in the top 16% of the world's wealthy. If you have one meal a day, some sort of dwelling that keeps the rain and elements off of you and some way to get around. 84% of the world today lives with less than that. What constitutes material well-being? The Hebrew term blessing, barach, even more so infers not just material well-being, but more so relational well-being. In the Hebrew cultural context, God, by extending his blessing to us, is committing himself into a familial relationship with us, a family situation, like a good Hebrew father would give his blessing to his children God is saying, I am pleased, I am happy to be called your father. 
so that whether or not we consider ourselves at some level of material blessedness, we are out without question rich, wealthy in our relationship with God when we participate in his family life, to be blessed. And this is why this blessing of God must be understood in more of a communal sense rather than our Western hermeneutic, interpretive way of always going toward individual wealth production. A wonderful Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann, for example, refers to this as the collective us when he says Israel as the collective us is meant to be a case study so that the nations may know Yahweh and join the multitude of praise makers. I love that. Join the multitude of praise makers. Musicians, and in fact all of the arts, are so missionally necessary, you see, in terms of increasing the number of worshipers so that God's purpose of a multitude of praise makers is fulfilled. But even that is really only the secondary point of this verse, the, the blessing and what it means. What it is primarily getting at is the reason God blesses us at all as a collective family, a collective community. As the rest of verse 1 clarifies, God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. We can understand this if we take time to study a wee bit and back up and consider that the blessing that is intoned here in Psalm 67 is almost Catch that almost an exact duplication of what is called the ironic blessing. Not ironic, Aaronic, to do with Aaron, when Aaron and his clan were made the first priests of Israel. Given by God himself through his prophet Moses, way back at Israel's inception in Numbers chapter 6, the 24th verse. You don't have to turn to it, just listen. It is almost, almost an exact duplication, but with a slight, but as you'll see, a very significant change, a variation. There in number 624, we read these words. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. Remember this when we sing that every day. <laughs> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom, peace. Now, if we compare this with what we read here in Psalm 67, they sound very similar indeed in our English versions. But the Hebrew text renders a difference in them that I believe is far-reaching in its importance and its implication. I've put it here so you can see it clearly. The original Aaronic blessing reads literally in Hebrew, as I've translated it here, the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face shine upon you. That word upon is the Hebrew eleka, which literally means upon. Eleka, it's an Hebraic liturgical form that is invoking, in this case, anointing. 
God smile upon you in the sense of anointing. The writer of Psalm 67, however, amends that just slightly in the Hebrew text to read literally, God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine itanu, through you. Here it's the Hebrew itanu, which is literally through. It's an Hebraic liturgical form in Psalm 67 that is not invoking anointing, it's invoking incarnation. How does God show himself through his people? The one says shine upon, the other says shine through. And of course, the difference between these two is striking in the Hebrew language and what it says to us even today. For the one suggests, doesn't it, the simple enjoyment of God's blessing, while the other is more precisely getting at what is the intent of God's blessing. Beyond the simple joy of being on the receiving end of his blessing, what is God's intent in blessing us at all? In other words, the writer of this psalm is subtly suggesting that the blessing of God comes to us not solely for our own benefit, not solely for our own personal enjoyment, but with the intent that by blessing us, God may shine through us to others that God's gracious character might be reflected in us, is what the Hebrew means. God be gracious to us and bless us, and therefore, thereby allow your face, O Lord, to be reflected in us. Allow your face to shine through me. That is the type of blessing this psalm is speaking of. It's taken the ironic blessing, one of a invoking liturgically anointing and twisted it into a liturgical form invoking incarnational living. This came through to me just a number of years ago in such a powerful way as so often can happen with we children. Three years ago, my our oldest daughter, Heather, who's married to a wonderful African guy named Carlo, and they now have, well, even back then, they had five children already. And they're a mixed race children. They're beautiful, caramel, we call them the caramel kids, <laughs> or the caramel critters. <laughs> uh, for various financial reasons, they had to come and live with us for a year and a half. So for a year and a half, we had 12 people in a three-bedroom flat, one bathroom, for one and a half year. We called it chaotic joy. <laughs> it was wonderful, but it was total mayhem all the time. Well, one Sunday, our church called Mosaic gathered, and we meet in the afternoon at a interesting place where we meet. And uh, so we come home about five, six o'clock, and it's time for something to eat. We're all gathered around the table, all this mayhem and chaos going on. And Heather's wee little youngest or oldest child named Malachi, who at that time would have been six years old, we sit at the table and he began to ask some questions. And he said, began by saying, Mom, uh, my Sunday school teacher today confused me. Well, that got all of our attention, like what's going on at church? <laughs> so we're all listening quite intently. And she said, oh, really? What, what, why, Malachi? He said, well, she said to us that God is the God of all the universe. He's bigger than anything. Is that true, mummy? And Heather said, well, that is true. He, he's the creator. He's bigger than anything. He said, 
Well, then our Sunday school teacher said, but God lives in us. Is that true, mummy? She said, well, yes, Malachi, of course that's true. He, being a Christian means God lives in you. And his last question was, well, mummy, if God is bigger than us, and he lives in us, wouldn't he show through? Wouldn't he show through? It was one of those theologically pregnant moments for us. We all went, gosh, that's like profoundly convicting. <laughs> Wouldn't he show through? This has something to say about God's intent in bringing blessing. It is not to appease our selfish cravings. It is not so that we might wallow in abundance. It has nothing to do with the private assurance of health and wealth and happiness. God blesses us so that our lives reflect his presence that he shows through and thereby draws the world to himself. So I want you to think about this with me right now where you're sitting, just in quietness. In what ways has God blessed you? In what ways has he given you rich relationships friendships, teachers, friends, this Chehi family. And is he showing through? To draw others to himself. Just a moment to think about that in quietness. I think it really ought to melt down our cold spirits, our callous evangelicalism, and push us into the world, back into circulation. When you understand God blesses you so that he can shine through our communal, collective relationships, that's the reason he blesses us. This psalm doesn't stop there. It goes on to remind us of God's manner of relating to this world around us. We see that in verse 2. That your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. The text here in the first part of verse 2 is referring to God's way. That your ways may be known, and it means his manner, the manner in which God chooses to relate to human beings that he himself has created. And the verse infers, doesn't it, that God's ways, his manner, is not known in the world at large. For example, the current, and I think understandable, postmodern preoccupation with nihilism, with a sense of meaninglessness could be traced at least as far back as the French thinker Jean-Paul Sartre who said that you are nothing more than an actor on a shattered and deserted stage without director, without prompter, without audience in which every individual has to make up their own rules. I want to suggest Sartre said all that, by the way, in an important book to read, Critique de la raison dialectique, 
a dialectic about the critique of reason. But I want to suggest that though this is admirable because of its honesty, I don't think this is reflective of God's manner, God's ways. Well then, what are God's ways? His chosen manner of relating to human life. Grammatically, the second part of verse 2 is appositional to the first part. That simply means that it more particularly defines or explains what has just come. And so God's way, according to verse 2, his manner of relating to us is salvation, that your ways may be known on the earth, that is to say, your salvation among all the nations. The term salvation is the, in Hebrew is Yeshua Theka, Yeshua Theka from the root Yeshua. And in fact, it is the Hebrew word, root of the name Jesus. As you might remember, the Gospel of Matthew specifies this. You shall call his name Jesus, Yeshua, for he shall save his people, salvation from their sins. And do you know what Yeshua literally means? It means to rescue. And you see then what this suggests. It suggests that God's way, his manner, is not some sort of deistic notion of nonchalance or non-involvement by our creator. Nor is it the pharisaical tendency to condemn out of hand and we relate to God on his judgment and his anger and his wrath. But God's way, his manner, is to reach down into the depths of a lonely and forlorn world such as Sartre rightly describes and rescue us. He loves us so much that though he, we could be left to suffer the results of our own doing, our own sin, our own rebellion, God's way is Yeshua. God's way is rescue. God's way is Jesus. But to be honest, even then, the real stress of this verse is not that. The real stress of this verse is that God's purposes in this salvation are not limited to Western culture, nor to capitalistic ideology, nor even to Israeli land rights. But his vision is universal, international in scope. And so the text says, so very clearly that he desires all peoples to experience rescue, that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all, all, all nations, says this text. The God of the Bible is not a white God, nor is he a black God nor is he an Asian God, nor is he a European God, and certainly not an American God. But he is God, the sovereign Lord of every race and culture and people. I love my own name claim. John Wesley prayed, take back my interest in your blood, O Christ, if it does not flow for the whole human race. So I want us to take another moment to stop and pause and reflect and let this sink in and ask yourselves a few questions. What does it tell you about God, about God if his manner of relating to us is in terms of rescue? 
What does it tell you about humanity if God thinks we need rescue? And most pertinent of all, do you need to be rescued? Do you need God's saving work in your life, even right now? I know this is just the beginning of our Chehi experience, but maybe that's a pertinent question to somebody today. Do you need rescue? that only Yeshua can bring you, Jesus. You shall name him Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Just think about that in quietness before we conclude. What does it tell you about God if his manner is rescue? What does it tell you about humanity if we need to be rescued? Do you need God's saving work right now? I so encourage you that if you sense that need to really know Yeshua and be rescued from the ugliness of your own sin, the sin of the world, speak to one of your counselors or friends you trust or myself. I'd be happy to talk over these next days. I think it ought to melt away our spiritual frigidity push us out into circulation if we really believe that God's way is to rescue people and that many people in many places throughout creation do not know or misunderstand God's manner. If our cold-hearted indifference has not yet been affected, then this psalm reminds us as we come to its conclusion of the grandest picture, the grandest vision of all in verses 3, 4, 5. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. It is a vision of all peoples rendering to God the praise only he deserves. And I want to suggest by way of finishing up this morning what I would call a radical anthropology that is biblically assumed in a vocative exclamation like this. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. It echoes a radical anthropological perspective that reverberates throughout the overarching narrative story of the Bible that all of creation, including, of course, the apex human beings themselves, All of creation is designed to praise the Creator. That basic to our creaturely instincts, built into the framework of the very created order around us, is the submerged, though still resident, urge to praise God. That is what Jesus was after, I think, when he stated so unequivocally that if we did not shout the praises of God, the very rocks would cry out. 
It is a radical anthropology which understands human beings not as simply existing unto themselves, but in the vast scope of the broader scheme of things that all creation is designed to render praise to the Father. That we are no more ourselves. We are no more fully human as God created us to be than when, like Brueggemann said, we join the multitude of praise makers. That every created thing, according to the Bible, the mountains and trees which clap their hands, the rocks and stones which cry aloud, the heavens and firmament which declare the glory of God, in every person of humanity as well, discover a freeing sense of congruity when they praise God. And as we think in terms of missionary vision that we are all contributors to, including practitioners of the fine arts and especially the musical arts. This is the ultimate and loftiest objective of all that we do, of all our evangelism, all of our outreach, all of our mission endeavors here and around the globe. The services we render, the ministries we perform, the churches that we begin, the social change that follows in the wake, even the conversions of people that we witness, in point of fact, they are all secondary. For they actually point toward a greater goal, a nobler purpose, a grander vision that all peoples everywhere should render praise and join the multitude of praise makers. What we are working toward is worship. That's what it's all about. That, I believe, is why we should be committed to being what I call missional musicians, to do our small part in increasing the multitude of praise makers. Oh, I think it ought to break our hearts for the world and melt our icy spirits when you get a vision of this, when you understand God's future, when you can actually picture it with your mind's eye. One day, when a mighty choir, of which the Chehi voices will be an infinitesimal part, made up of peoples from every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every race, every ethnic grouping, shall render unceasing praise to God for one reason, that his glory demands it, and the corollary that the design of creation itself requires it. That's what we see coming, and I want you to join me in speaking it out. Speak this out with me from Revelation 5 and note the grandeur of this vision. They sang a new song with these words. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it, for you were slain and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation and you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked again, and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and the elders, and they sang in a mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth 
and under the earth and in the sea, and they sang, Blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne, to the Lamb forever and ever. Can you get that pictured in your mind that that is what you are contributing to as you bring your music to add to the multitude of praise makers? That is why you're here. To increase worship. That every act of a follower of Jesus is an expression of worship. That music as Luther said is the handmaid of theology. Music as we sing if we have heard God in this Psalm 67 today, I am convinced it will melt down our homogeneous sectarianism and put us into circulation in the midst of the broad and varied and oh so interesting world that God created. When we finally get the broader vision of God's overarching grandiose purpose, of all the earth worshiping, mountains and trees, rocks and stones, heavens and firmament, animals and plants and people, human beings of all types and shapes, children and elderly, yuppies and misfits, rebels and status quoers, intellectuals and high school dropouts, black people and white people and red people and yellow people and green people, purple people if they exist, Scots and Iranians and Kurds and Iraqis and Chinese and Africans and Latins and Eskimos and even Americans. <laughs> All the earth standing together, a multitude of praise makers in recognition of the majesty of his glory. May the peoples praise you, O oh God. May all the peoples praise you. That is the vision of Psalm 67. And I think it inspires a simple but compelling imperative that is stuck in my mind and spirit placed there by this man, an African large bishop riding a large motorcycle, covering a large distance with a large high caliber rifle on his back. Can you just picture this guy? With a collar as a good Episcopalian all over Africa when I heard him say, let us melt down the saints and put them into circulation. You're going to have some great experiences in the weeks ahead. But brothers and sisters, men and women, we need to be melted and broken. Because God wants you in circulation to increase the multitude of praise makers. Lord, thank you for Psalm 67. And I pray that you would melt my own heart, break through my own callousness, break through my stubbornness, shine through me 
bless not for our own sakes, but that through us Christ might shine. And allow us the privilege of bringing many more into the multitude that will praise you forever and ever and ever. We're here in this school to teach worship of the one true living God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.